January 27th, 1825, Boston, Massachusetts. The very first official meeting held to consider forming the American Unitarian Association. And after the preliminary remarks and declaration of intention of the meeting were made, the very first recorded comments, we have the transcript, it was dutifully taken by notes, not by Zoom, whatever it is that does that. <laughs> the very first recorded comments made by Reverend Dr. Bancroft of Worcester, Massachusetts. Worcester. <laughs> I know that word, Worcester. He said this, he said, I am fearful that we take sufficient care in the manner of instituting these meetings so proposed. I feel that Unitarianism should be propagated slowly and silently. It has always been so from the beginning with the progress of Unitarianism in this country. Slowly and silently. So I, I do want to try and say a couple things about this conversation we're starting to have about an eighth principle. And I know many of you have been in conversation with one another here and congregations across the country have been deliberating this question of, of, of should we adopt an eighth principle. So we're going to get there. But I think the most important thing for having a good conversation about it is some context. Where, where do we come from? What are we? And where are we going? Two neighbors were considering uh, joining their yards. They lived in a duplex, and the fence between their yards was old, and they thought it was just about time to make one yard, one front yard together. And they had had some conversation about it, but now they were on television. They were on a show which inspired this sermon's title called Big Dreams, Small Spaces. Anybody a Monty Don fan? We have a couple, okay, good. This is, Monty Don is a very important figure who you need to know about. He's the uh, preeminent British gardener. He's a celebrity gardener who goes around and helps people vision in their own gardens and officiates at big ceremonial garden things that happen in, in the UK. But he has a show called Big Dreams, Small Spaces. And on this particular episode, these two women were considering merging their yards. And they decided that, yes, they would do that. And they told Monty Don that was the plan. And they said that we, we know it seems a bit unusual, but this really makes sense for us in this yard. We think it will look beautiful. And, and Monty replies to them, well, you know, actually, the thing is, it doesn't seem unusual at all. As you describe it, it seems quite reasonable. But the fact of the matter it is, it is very unusual. It is very unusual to take away this barrier and combine two things into one. What's much more usual is, uh, is the opposite. This word I mentioned last week, schismogenesis that something new is created by fracturing apart from something else and defines itself, therefore, in opposition to the thing it has split from. I came across this term because of the book, The Dawn of Everything, um, which is a, a, a beautiful, if dense, read. Um, but it, they talk about, they're, they're re, re understanding the whole history of indigenous cultures as a way of relocating ourselves in relationship to human history. And they talk about uh, this schismogenesis in relationship to Athens and Sparta. That was one of the examples. But also right here, the, the native folks in California and the folks up in the Northwest. The folks up in the Northwest had an aristocratic slaveholding approach to civilization. And down here in California, 
they defined themselves in opposition. They had all the same resources. They could have gone that way, but they defined themselves in opposition to their neighbors and said, no, we won't have slaves. We won't follow this aristocratic. And, and in fact, that led them away from cultivating uh, storehouses of food the way that they did in the Northwest. So these cultures split apart and differentiated one another in order, in order to define their identities as different than your neighbor. It makes me think of, of this psychological research that we are most judgmental, not of people who are completely different than us, but the people who are quite similar but have made one significantly different choice especially if it's a choice that we thought about ourselves and considered the way that they went, but made the other decision. That is when we are most judgmental, right? So this is, this is schismogenesis. And that is the history of, of Protestant sects. It's the history of religious traditions emerging from one another, defining ourselves in opposition. So Unitarians defining ourselves in opposition to the Trinity, right? We are the people descended from those who disbelieved in the three-part God and, that, and, 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 a, and a constellation of other ideas that came with that, that we wanted to use reason in our understanding of religion in interpreting the Bible, that we wanted to have tolerance of other beliefs. Those were ideas that became associated with this central heresy, heresy of course to, to choose, to make this decision. To, they, they, we made this decision about the divinity of Jesus and it led to this different culture, this different people, these Unitarians. I'm gonna try and give you the history of Unitarian Universalism in about five minutes here. We'll see how it goes. The, the Universalists, on the other hand, had a different bone to pick, a different heresy. The central heresy of the Universalists was universal salvation, that there is no hell, that God, in its essence, is love, and that no one is outside of the bounds of that love. These two streams of American Protestantism, the ideas go back further, but, but really as organizations, as, as groups of people getting together, we, we will talk about our, our distant cousins, the Transylvanian Unitarians in a couple weeks, but, but there was not a direct lineage. We didn't grow out of that. We, we started here in the United States in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And we struggled from the get-go with what does it mean to be an association of, of free thinking? What does it mean to, to, to try and build the Unitarian side? What does it mean to try and build a church around these principles that in some ways are opposed to defining and categorizing what you are? The Unitarians, the, the context was, was the intellectual elite in large part. Right? This was the Boston Brahmin, the, the sages of Concord, these very highly educated intellectual folks grappling with big ideas and connecting to the world, the whole world with ideas. The first people, again, this, the, we went from Christianity, so the three, th the three streams that make up Unitarian Universalism are Christianity, Transcendentalism, and humanism. We can, we can break it down to those, those are the three streams that feed into where we've become. And so they moved from Christianity to transcendentalism. Folks like Henry Th David Thoreau inviting us to bathe in the forest, and Ralph Waldo Emerson, and Theodore Parker. And then in the early 20th century is when humanism became a significant thread, when we started questioning the Unitarianism, even the Unitarian view of God and Christianity, and evolved into something else entirely. So Christianity, transcendentalism, humanism, as this rapidly changing theological move of the Unitarians. Universalists were a different group of people. And the, the best synopsis, the quick, easy way of saying it that I've enjoyed from Michelle Hunovan's new book, Search, which I know some people are reading because it's, it's a novel, a, a, a fictional novel about a Unitarian Universalist search committee. So it's timely for, for some of us here. She makes a quip at one point, though, that Unitarians, you think of Ralph Waldo Emerson, Universalists, think of P.T. Barnum. 
P.T. Barnum was a universalist. And I think that does give you a flavor of who they were. They, 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 they were part of that second great awakening of preachers who would run around the countryside throwing revivals and getting people excited about this message that, that God is love, that no one is outside of the bounds of love, that there is no hell, and that therefore we will build up a kingdom of heaven here on earth that will not exclude anyone. And this is the way that the universalists get to some of that transcendentalism and, and humanism. They say, well, maybe, maybe if, if our message is about everybody is in this circle, maybe it, we better start figuring that out now. We don't need to wait till heaven where we're all gonna end up. Let's start figuring out how to get along now. Along the way, there were these moments of trying to, to, to categorize, to calcify, to, to show what we were becoming. And we talked last week about James Freeman Clark and those five points of the new theology, that leadership of God and uh, fatherhood of God and the leadership of Jesus and the brotherhood of man and the salvation by character and the progress of mankind onward and upward forever. Those, in some ways, that five points uh, you might see as the basis of what then became the six principles. Very different six principles when Unitarianism and Universalism merged in, in 1961. And then what became seven principles and purposes, adding one but also changing all of the six in, in 1985. We do this, this is what we do. We, we look at what we are saying is most important to us and we ask, is it still relevant? Is it still the right thing to be focused on? This is how then President Eugene Pickett in the late 70s put it as, as that need to update our principles was beginning to be clear. He said, the deeper malaise lies in our confusion as to what word we have to spread. Our confusion about what word we have to spread. Who is this religion for and what is it giving them? The old watchwords, he said, of liberalism, freedom, reason, tolerance, Worthy though they may be, are simply not catching the imagination of the contemporary world. They describe a process for approaching the religious depths, but they testify to no intimate acquaintance with the depths themselves. If we are ever to speak to a new age, we must supplement our seeking with some profound religious finds. Got to supplement our seeking with some profound finds. There are two people I want to tell you a little bit about. Uh, Ethelred Brown was uh, born in Jamaica in 1875, and he was struck at one point in his life by how odd this whole Trinitarian Christianity was and got it in his head to become a Unitarian after reading Channing's Baltimore Sermon, one of these early sermons of Unitarianism. His journey, uh, it's detailed in a, in a book called Black Pioneers in a White Denomination. But his journey was essentially one of heartbreak after heartbreak when trying to serve Unitarianism, he found that there was no support financially or, um, or, or even in kind words from the American Unitarian Association. A little bit later was Louis McGee, who was born in Scranton, Pennsylvania, 1893. And he was uh, born a slave and then became an AME minister and then discovered Unitarianism by accident, a mail carrier uh, he was working as at the time. And, and he found a, a magazine in the mail called the Christian Register. And it was a Unitarian magazine. And, and he delayed delivery a couple of days to read it. <laughs> 
and when he came and, and rang the doorbell uh, of the woman, he confessed <laughs> to his, his uh, delay. And the Unitarian woman responded, well, help yourself, read it all you want, and, and I invite you to visit our, our church down on Euclid Avenue. And he, he talked about the dignity that he found in that congregation. And that was what drew him to wanting to become a Unitarian minister. He became a, a, a prominent humanist and atheist. He did serve uh, Unitarian churches, but he, it was out of the question for him to serve as a, as a black man to minister to a white church. And while he, uh, while he was a student at Meadville Lombard, our, our seminary in Chicago, he was hired by the association to survey the black community on Chicago's south side and assess the viability of a black Unitarian church there. All of those dreams came to naught, but the legacy is there. There were people, black people in our faith trying to make it theirs 150 years ago. And I, I just wonder what, what alternate reality, what other possibilities could have been had some different choices been made then. Mark Morrison Reed, who, who wrote that book about these men and other, other black pioneers in a white denomination, says, I have come to believe that the more fundamental obstacle has been an arrogance that has limited our vision. So self-satisfied were we that we could not imagine attracting many, save others who were like us but didn't know it. Our leaders were simply unwilling to reach out to those who did not fit our mold. When I was uh, 15 years old, uh, I was trained and inspired by our young religious Unitarian Universalists, the, the YRUU, the successor of the liberal religious youth, which had another important role in our history in merging Unitarianism and Universalism. And part of what I discovered as a young teenage leader was our anti-racism trainings, which in the 1990s, we were the most important work of the youth movement. They were at the forefront of everything we were doing. And I, I remember a meeting where someone told me, Marcus, the way that you are leading, I was the facilitator for our youth council, the way that you are leading is racist and misogynist and it needs to stop. And I, I left and cried for a couple of hours and it was years of, of processing and trying to understand, you know, I, I, I've got two moms. I'm not, I'm not one of those. <laughs> those guys, those people. But I'm so grateful for the way in which that moment shaped and influenced my journey. I'm hopeful that we as a society and Unitarian Universalism are beginning to take more seriously the racism, especially the racism that's embedded in our culture. So here's, here's the proposed eighth principle. There's not going to be a vote on it at General Assembly. Um, I contributed to some misinformation about that. But it is under consideration. Congregations are adopting it, and we're looking at a wholesale revi re revising of the, of the principles and purposes in the next couple of years as an association. That will be talked about at this General Assembly. The eighth principle, as it's proposed, reads like this. We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universal Association, covenant to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. 
I know that that's a mouthful. Um, but if anybody can read off all seven, I mean, off the top of your head, the principles and purposes already. No, I didn't think so. <laughs> I, I might be able to do it, but it, yeah, wordy stuff. We, we like our words. But, but you know, I, I, so I, I, I've been thinking about this a lot, and, and I, I don't have a lot to say about it, but I, I, if someone were to ask me to write our eighth principle about this topic, this isn't exactly the language I'd come up with. No one asked me to write language for our eighth principle. <laughs> this is coming from Unitarian Universalists of color who would like us to listen and get on board. And to me, that's about the most important part of the conversation. Oh, where do we come from? And who are we becoming? What will we have to give up to get there? What losses, what might we need to grieve, and, and what makes it worth it? I think these are the questions because to stop growing, to stop changing, to stop evolving and becoming something different than we are now, that is what would be a betrayal of our faith. That's what would be a betrayal of the spiritual gifts that our ancestors have given us. Monty Don says in, in every episode as he's helping these aspirant gardeners envision what might be possible, says, I, I do believe that however small your garden is, everybody can cultivate a big dream. And so it is with us. Wherever we are, in our own lives, in our common life as a religious tradition, however small, everybody can cultivate a big dream. Maybe so. Amen.